This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello, everyone. Several years ago, there was a debate between Michael Brown and James White, representing Trinitarians, and Anthony Buzzard and Joseph Good, representing Unitarians. And in that debate, Brown and White brought up Revelation 5, 12 to 14, where they're bowing down and worshiping God and the Lamb. And if you watch that debate, and I'll put a link below so you can look at it. If you watch that debate, Michael Brown keeps insisting over and over, that cannot be to a man. That just cannot be. So we're going to take a look at that in this video, and we're going to find out how wrong Brown and White are on that matter. Revelation chapter 5. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And so in that debate, Michael Brown is insisting this just cannot be toward a man. First, this word that is translated as worshipped is the Greek word proskuneu. And that is a word which basically just means bowing down in submission to or subjection to a higher authority. That's what it means in Scripture. And you'll see that there's all kinds of examples in the scriptures where men are bowing down before other men using this word. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb to receive this worship. All creation bowing down before God and the Lamb. Let's just go look at the context. The information in the context tells Brown that they're bowing down before a man. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy 
to open the book and to break its seals. Who is worthy? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I wept greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion, the one being out of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. A human being is in view, a descendant of David of the tribe of Judah. Behold the lion, the one being out of the tribe of Judah. A lamb standing as if slain. The four elders, the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. The 24 elders fell down before the lamb. The lamb who was slain for you were slain and with your blood you purchased for god men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation a lamb who was dead they're bowing down to a man who was a carcass of flesh hanging lifeless and dead on a cross a sacrificial lamb a dead human who God raised from the dead. By definition, they are bowing down before a human being who had been dead. A lamb is that. He's the sacrificial lamb. By definition, this lamb was a human. Michael Brown is arguing that this could not be toward a human, a man. By definition, the lamb is a human being who was dead. Even in their own doctrine, Trinitarians argue that God the Son had to become a man so he could die on a cross. The lamb is by definition a human, a human who was dead a dead corpse, a dead carcass of flesh. They're bowing down before someone who was a dead carcass, stone dead, a human being. The lamb who had been slain, a man who had been a corpse of dead flesh, hanging on a cross, taken down, from the cross, a dead corpse, a dead corpse laying in a tomb, a dead lamb. By definition, they're bowing down before a lamb who is by definition a man, a human being who was dead. We need to look no further. The answer is right in front of Brown's nose. Is that dead corpse hanging on the cross God the Son? Are they, are they carrying God the Son to the tomb? Are they putting God in a tomb? Is God laying dead in the tomb? In Trinity world, God the Son is immortal, which by definition means he cannot be dead. The person God the Son cannot be dead. God the Son has a divine nature which cannot be dead. God the Son also has an immortal human soul, which by definition cannot be dead. That's what immortal means. You cannot be dead. So the only thing left which could be dead is a body of flesh, a corpse. A dead carcass hanging on a cross. That 
is what they are bowing down to in Revelation 5. A lamb that had been slain, a dead man, a dead carcass of flesh that God raised from the dead. By definition, the lamb was a dead body hanging on the cross. And that's what they are bowing down to. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. The elders fell down before a human being who had been dead. By definition, they are bowing down before a created thing. A lamb who had been stone dead. A human being who had been dead. Slain. Dead. Otherwise, he wouldn't be the lamb. Not only so, we are told this is why this man is worthy. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain. And with your blood you purchase for God men. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb. A lamb that was dead, by definition, a human being, a man. And here is why they're bowing down to this man. He, God the Father, raised him from the dead. Again, that's a man. From the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all rule, and authority, and power, and dominion, and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. That's why all creation bows down before this man who God raised from the dead. He is far above all other rule and authority, except the Father. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident or obvious that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. In other words, it should be obvious to you Every name that is named except the Father. We need to say that because to some people it isn't obvious. Far above all rule. This is why this lamb, who had been dead flesh, is worshipped by all creation. This created lamb that was hanging dead on a cross overcame and sat down on his father's throne, which throne represents authority over all creation, the father's throne. See Revelation 3.21. A created human being was dead, and God raised him to life, this sacrificial lamb and seated him, this man, who was dead, at his right hand, which is a position of authority over all creation. And that's why they bow down before this lamb, who was dead. Now, a little later, we will see the Bible is even more forcefully clear on the matter. But first, let's look at the response Joseph Good gave during this debate with Brown and White, because he gave the right answer, but they just sort of sloughed him off and ignored him. David said to all the assembly, now bless Yahweh your God, and all the assembly blessed Yahweh the God of their fathers, 
and bowed low and worshipped Yahweh and the king. First Chronicles 29, 20. They worship Yahweh and the king. This is the same word used in Revelation 5, the passage we were just looking at. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word here is proskuneo. And it's basically the equivalent of the Hebrew word that's used in this verse. And we can be pretty sure the Jews weren't up to some sneaky translation tricks here because they translated this before Jesus was even born. So you can see that they had no thought that this word is a word you only use to refer to an act toward God. And there's all kinds of evidence of this in Scripture. Notice they bowed down low and worshiped Yahweh and the king. The king in question here is King David. Notice that all the assembly, all the assembly bowed down before Yahweh and King David. Now in that same debate, James White argued that if all creation bows down before the Lamb, then that excludes him from being a created thing, which we have already seen is obviously wrong. Well, if that's the case, then King David is not part of the assembly of Israel either. That was White's silly little argument that he had in that debate. By the same token, King David is not an Israelite in this verse, because all the assembly bowed down before King David. Why is that happening? Now, you'll also see, if you watch that debate, when Joseph Good brings this up, Michael Brown tries to come back to this idea that, well, you can do certain things before a human king, but not in a religious context. In a religious context, it's different, right? And that's what he was trying to spin. Does this look like it just might be a religious context? Bless Yahweh your God. And all the assembly blessed Yahweh, the God of their fathers, and bowed down low and worshipped Yahweh and the king. Seems to be a religious context. So why is this happening? Why are they bowing down before Yahweh and the king? And notice what David said to them. Bless Yahweh your God. Bless Yahweh. And so what do they do? They bowed down low and worshipped Yahweh and King David. What? Why? Well, the Bible tells us why plainly and clearly and unambiguously. If you keep reading, Three verses later, it says, Then Solomon sat on the throne of Yahweh, the throne of God, as king instead of his father, David. First Chronicles 29, 20 to 23. Solomon sat on the throne of God. That's what it says. Well, what does that mean? David and Solomon had sat upon the throne of God over the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in this context is the people of Israel. And a throne represents kingly authority, right? A king sits in a fancy king chair we call a throne. God's throne rep represents his 
kingly authority. In the Bible, the word throne is often used as a metonymy, which simply means the word throne is a word used to refer to kingly authority. For example, when Gabriel says to Mary that he will receive the throne of his father, David, referring to baby Jesus receiving the throne of his father, David. Well, that obviously doesn't mean that God preserved a 1,000-year-old fancy king chair that King David sat on, and he's going to keep it for Jesus to sit on. It's not about a real chair. It's about the same kind of kingly authority. God was the only king of Israel, but... At 1 Samuel 8, Israel rejected God as their king, demanding to have a human king. They wanted to be like all the other nations and have a human king. And God warned them about the consequences, but they still demanded to have a human king. So God granted it to them. Israel then had a human king between them and God. This human king executed the authority of God's throne, which means he, this human king, reigned as king on God's behalf, being anointed by God's spirit. So what that means is to sit on the throne of God is now this human king was executing the authority of king that was really God's authority because God was supposed to be their king. So to bow before this throne was to bow before God himself because this human king was God's anointed authority who ruled his kingdom in God's name, who ruled God's kingdom in God's name. And when you read Philippians 2, 9 to 11, which we'll look at in a bit, you need to understand this, because this is what's going on with Jesus as well. So to bless Yahweh, their God, the Israelites bowed down before King David. The man who was appointed this kingly authority by God to exercise the kingly authority of God's throne. In other words, since Israel wanted a human king, Instead of God as their king, it was now a human king who executed God's kingly authority over his, God's kingdom, the people of Israel. And yes, David was a created human. They were bowing down before a created human. And so was his descendant, the son of David, Jesus of Nazareth. So by bowing down before King David, the Israelites are bowing down before their God. And that doesn't mean King David is their God. They're bowing down before God's authority, King David. And by bowing down before God's appointed authority, his delegated authority, they are bowing down before their God. Same thing happened with Pharaoh and Joseph. To be an Egyptian and to come and bow down before Joseph, you were bowing down before Pharaoh because Joseph was how Pharaoh was ruling Egypt. Same kind of idea. That proskuneo worship cannot be given to a human being is a fabricated myth, which is relentlessly perpetuated in Trinity world. Lies. They tell all kinds of lies about this. Here, here's an interesting verse for you to think about. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do look lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. Revelation 3.9, King James Version. 
See, when the King James translators translated this, this word worship in English, it didn't mean an act only due to God. This is what Trinitarians have been perpetuating. And it's the same Greek word. This Greek word just means to bow down before a higher authority. And that's why it's used all throughout the Greek translation of the Old Testament and in the New Testament to refer to bowing down in subjection to a higher authority. David and Solomon were given God's kingly authority over the kingdom of God, the people of Israel. The promised son of David, Jesus, was raised from the dead and given all, all authority over all creation, the authority of God's heavenly throne. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's what happened when he sat down at the right hand of God. Second in command, there's only one who is higher than Jesus, God the Father. And that's why it says he sits at the right hand of God the Father. We are told why this man is worthy. Why is this man worthy? Because he was slain. And so what did God do? He raised him and seated him at his right hand. Having made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than them. What did we read in Ephesians chapter 1? A name that is above every name. He inherited this name when God raised him from the dead. He became superior to the angels. God doesn't need to become superior to the angels, but a man would. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, see there's that language again, having gone into heaven, angels and authorities and powers, having been subjected to him. That's why they need to bow down to him. He's a higher authority. He became superior to the angels. He raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. For as the Hebrews writer said, he has inherited a better name than the angels. God raised a man from the dead and gave a man all authority in heaven and earth. All creation bows down to an exalted man that God raised from the dead. To the Lamb, blessing and honor and glory and dominion. And here's why. The Bible tells you why. He became superior to the angels having inherited a more excellent name. In other words, a higher position. God made Jesus Lord of all creation. Acts 2.36 Did God become superior to the angels or a man? A man was raised from the dead, and a man was given all authority over absolutely everything including the angels. He became superior to the angels, having inherited a better name than them. Does God need to inherit a better name than the angels? I don't think so. Remember, we are told this is why this man is worthy. And Paul tells us the same. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Wherefore, 
God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul tells us this man is worthy for the very same reason that we read in Revelation chapter 5. This man was obedient to the point of death. He was slain, dead, a dead carcass. And so God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. Same thing we read in Ephesians. Same thing we're reading at Hebrews 1, 3 to 4. When Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2, there's an allusion to Isaiah 45, 23, where Yahweh, the God of Israel, speaks these words. And so Trinitarians, like James White in this very same debate, concludes Jesus is Yahweh. And here's what it says. I have sworn by myself the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear or confess you like. Isaiah 45, 23. So you can see how a short-sighted Trinitarian gets this notion, right? How about if we actually read the context and see what happens with this claim that James White makes in that debate? And there is no other God besides me. Did Jesus say that? a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Did Jesus say that? Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Did Jesus say that? Because if Jesus said this, nobody else is God but Jesus himself. He would be excluding everyone else. Do you see James White's blunder? Or did Jesus Christ's God say that? His God that highly exalted him for being obedient. Yes, of course, it's Jesus Christ God who said this. There's only one God to refer to, his God. Did Jesus say, no one is God except me, Jesus? Whoops. Or did the triune God say that? Maybe you could try to pull that one. No, that won't work. Jesus is not a three-person God. And a three-person God is not Jesus. Whoops. That's not going to work either. There's only one thing that's going to work. The Father. And that's why this verse ends, this passage, to the glory of the Father at Philippians 2.11. Note how Trinitarians, like James White, shoot themselves in the foot here. They have Jesus making himself the only person who is God. Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Remember, the Bible tells us why this happens. David said to all the assembly, Now bless Yahweh your God and the assembly, bless Yahweh the God of their fathers, and bow down low and worship 
Yahweh and the king. Same thing. Same authority structure idea. Same thing. The only difference is Jesus has authority over more than David did. That's the only difference. David had all this authority over Israel and executed God's authority over Israel. Jesus, the man, the son of David, executes this authority over all creation. God's authority. His God's authority. God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. Acts 17, 31. Who will judge the world? God the Father. How will God the Father judge the world? By means of a man whom he has appointed. You think that might be why Philippians 2.11 says, To the glory of God the Father, God highly exalted him through a man whom he has appointed. The day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his works. On the day when God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Same thing. Who's going to judge? God the Father will judge. How is he going to do it? Through a man he has appointed. Do you think that might be what's going on at Philippians 2, 8 to 11? To the glory of the Father. Of course, this is to the glory of the Father, since he, the Father, is responsible for it all. He raised this man from the dead. The Father seated this man at his right hand, making him Lord of all creation. And the Father has appointed this man. Through whom, who, through whom he, the Father, will judge the world. To bow down before the man, Jesus, is to bow down before God the Father's kingly authority. His own authority. Jesus, whom he has appointed, is the man. Jesus, God's anointed one, a man who became superior to angels when God seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, and through whom he, the Father, will judge the world to the glory of the Father. It's as plain as the nose on your face. If you would actually read the Bible, instead of, a pe instead of it's as plain as the nose on your face. If you would actually read your Bible instead of appealing to your man made doctrines. For God did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about? him you have made him a little lower than the angels you have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands you have put all things in subjection under his feet for in subjecting all things to him he left nothing that is not subject to him boy that is plain what is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made a man 
a little lower than the angels. You have crowned a man with glory and honor and have appointed a man over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under a man's feet. For in subjecting all things to a man, he left nothing that is not subject to a man. A man. God has put a man in charge. A man who was a dead carcass on the cross. A dead lamb. And he has raised him from the dead and gave him all authority. And that is why all creation bows down before a man. In that debate, Michael Brown insisted over and over that this worship of the Lamb in Revelation 5 cannot be to a man. Just go watch it. And then he goes even further and says, it's because he's got a divine ousia. Really? Is that what the Bible says? He's got one of those divine ousia dealies, and that's why the angels are bowing down before him. We are told why all creation bows down to a man. Brown argues it's because he's got a divine ousia, something you'll find nowhere in Scripture. The Bible says otherwise. The Bible tells us why all creation bows down to this man. All creation bows down to a human being because God exalted him, who was a dead man, to a position above the angels and subjected all the works of his hands to a man, the man Jesus. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Michael Brown is blind because his idolatry has made him blind. Pray for Michael Brown. And here's the best part of it all. In that passage we just read from Hebrews chapter 2, the writer is quoting Psalm 8. Let's go read Psalm 8, which is about the creation of man and his rule. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than Elohim, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands, you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the sea, Psalm 8. You have made him a little lower than Elohim. The Greek translation of the Old Testament has this as angels. And that is what the Hebrews writer is quoting. And so he endorses the idea that, yes, angels can be called Elohim. And this isn't the only passage where that happens. And notice what this passage is about. It's about when God created man in Genesis, and he gave to him to rule over the works of his hands. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky or the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What's Psalm 8 about? Psalm 8 is about what God did in Genesis when he made man. And that is what the Hebrews writer is quoting in chapter 2. He's quoting from Psalm 8, which is about the creation of man. And here he's saying that God has subjected everything to a man named Jesus, a created man. This is why all creation bows down to a man who had been dead. God raised him from the dead and gave him all authority in heaven and on earth. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. A Lamb who had been a dead carcass of flesh on a cross. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. The Lamb who had been a dead corpse of flesh laying in a tomb. The Bible tells us plainly, over and over actually, that they are bowing down before a Lamb who was slain, a human being who was a dead carcass of flesh, hanging dead on a cross. The Bible also tells us why this human being is worthy to receive these things. This man was obedient unto death, and so he is worthy. This one had overcome the lion from the tribe of Judah, overcame. And the Bible also tells us why. All creation bows down to this human being who had been a corpse of flesh laying dead in a tomb. God the Father raised this human from the dead, dead, stone dead, and gave him all authority in heaven and earth. A man who had been dead. This man overcame and sat down on his father's throne, which by definition means he was given the right to execute the kingly authority that throne represents his God's throne. It's plain and unambiguous, but Trinity idolaters don't want to see the plain truth which defies their own idol and their idolatry. Turn from your idolatry to serve the living God. There's only one God to refer to, one true God, and that only true God is Jesus Christ God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the good news of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of his God. Hello, this is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yars Word. In 2015, doctors in Brazil diagnosed Maria da Costa with a brain tumour. 
Tests revealed that the tumour was benign, which was wonderful news. But the location of the tumour was the problem. The tumour had to be removed, but doing so without irreparably damaging her ability to speak and reason was going to be extremely difficult. Her neurosurgeon, Carlos Rocha, explained that there was a serious risk of Maria losing her ability to speak, so she would need to be awake and able to speak to the medical team during the surgery. This is actually standard operating procedure for this type of risky surgery. Dr. Rocha recalls, quote, We had prearranged to do speech mapping with electrical stimuli to the brain and tests during surgery asking her to name objects and colours, read and talk. Unquote. Maria, however, had a better idea. She shocked the entire medical team when she began to sing. Remembering that frightening time, she says, quote, I wanted to feel confident during surgery and have some sort of control in my own way. My song thanked God for my life and for giving me the strength to fight and win through this difficult health battle that had been hanging over me since 2015. Unquote. Maria's strong faith in singing through her ordeal deeply moved her doctors. Her anesthesiologist, Dr. Paolo Fallo, said later, quote, There were a number of professionals involved in this procedure, and it was an emotional experience. Everyone couldn't stop talking about her courage, unquote. The complicated surgery took eight hours, but just four days later, Maria was headed home, walking, talking and praising Yah for his loving watch care over her. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, quote, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you, unquote. In a time of extreme stress with the potential for devastating failure, Maria trusted in her Heavenly Father and he carried her through. He'll do the same for you too. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 23 and 24 says, quote, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Yahushua Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The Earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events, and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth 
and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36 verse 26, He declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining His kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to Him. If you're enjoying WLC Radio, invite your friends to listen in too. If you know someone interested in last day events or you have a Bible study partner, tell them about our website, worldslastchance.com. You have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Mm -hmm.